Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. Good evening. I'm Carl Redman, retired executive editor of The Advocate newspaper. If you've been to the gas station any time in the last six months, you've noticed a trend at the pump. Fewer dollars per gallon to fill your tank, which is due to substantial drops in the price of a barrel of oil. Tonight we'll look at some of the factors causing that drop and what these lower prices could mean for Louisiana. Well, economists estimate that the oil and gas industry accounts for nearly 290,000 jobs in the state. And while the energy sector isn't the powerhouse revenue source it was in the 80s, the state budget still relies on 13% of its income from oil and gas dollars. Over the next hour, we'll explore this industry's contribution to our economy and the ripple effect of dropping prices on dollars per barrel, oil prices, and Louisiana. For Louisiana residents grateful to be paying less at the gasoline pump, economist Lauren Scott says he knows who to thank. Anytime I see the price of oil drop fast, the way it has now, uh, I'll look one place. I'll look to the Saudis. Scott says the last big drop was in the early 80s by Saudi Arabia to reestablish discipline in the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. The most recent price decrease was triggered by falling demand by the U.S. for international crude. This fracking phenomenon on the oil side caused U.S. oil production to rise since 2008, just since 2008, by 70 percent. And what that meant was instead of us importing 60 cents percent of the, 66 percent of the crude that we, we bring in, we're only importing 44 percent of the crude we brought in. In the summer, the Department of Commerce ruled U.S. companies could begin exporting diesel and gasoline. This threat of U.S. competition forced the Saudis to further rethink their pricing strategy. First of all, you took away the, a big share of our U.S. market. We're, you're importing only 44 percent now instead of 60 cents. Now you're going to go after the international market, our international market share? I don't think so. They dropped the price of oil. Crude oil prices have dropped from a high of nearly $110 per barrel last year to the low 50s this month. Oil field service provider Baker Hughes has announced it will cut 7,000 positions nationwide, including layoffs in Homa and Lafayette. Still, Scott says we're not facing the unemployment hit that rich oil shell states like North Dakota are. The good news for us is it's not happening here nearly in the same order of magnitude. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, our main oil shell plays, the Tuscaloosa Marine Shell, and there weren't very many rigs operating there in the first place. You know, you're, you're talking about in the teens, probably, uh, rigs operating in the Tuscaloosa Marine Shell. So even if you shut it totally down, we're not talking about that big a hit. Secondly, Scott says the recent price cut won't affect Louisiana's offshore drilling activity. Well, these big companies that operate out there, like uh, Exxon and, and, and BP and Shell, I mean, they have a 10-year planning horizon. They're not going to change their plans on the basis of what happens in a six-month time period. But to fully understand the impact of dropping oil prices on Louisiana's economy, you also have to consider the natural gas dynamic. Over the last seven years, the price of natural gas has declined from $12 per unit to three, a boon to the state's largest consumer of natural gas, chemical companies. Dan Bornet is president of the Louisiana Chemical Association. The chemical industry in Louisiana uses natural gas like a bakery shop uses flour. We use it to create electricity in our plants. We use it to generate steam and heat for our processes. But much more importantly than that, we use it as a raw material, as a basic feedstock from which other products flow. But the price of natural gas hasn't dropped in Europe. So cheaper American chemical products have gained market share overseas. Low natural gas prices have also attracted tremendous investment into the state, Scott says. This has just suddenly caused us 
to go from a situation where in a really good year, if we had $5 billion in industrial announcements, we'd have thought that was great. That would have been a great year. We have $120 billion in announcements in our state. It's just unheard of. This includes six liquid-to-gas export facilities in Calcasieu Parish alone. But Borne points out, for the industry to remain competitive, the price of oil must be high and natural gas prices relatively low. A healthy ratio would be if, 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 if a price of a barrel of oil is at least seven times greater than the price of what we call an MMBTU of natural gas. That's one unit of natural gas. If, if oil is at $60 a barrel and an MMBTU of natural gas is at $3 an MCF or an M MMBTU, that's a 20 to 1 ratio. So anything 7 to 1 or greater is good for Louisiana and good for the Gulf Coast. With the ratio dropping this month to around 18 to 1, South African energy giant Sassel put its $14 billion gas-to-liquids plant in Lake Charles on hold. Now, the difference is still way bigger than 7, but it's enough to make the, it's, it, what it's done is it, it's caused them to take their foot and take it from the accelerator to start tapping on the brake. Louisiana offered Sassel $257 million in subsidies to recruit them to the state. For Steve Spires, with the Louisiana Budget Project, the plant delay serves as a teaching moment. There's no tax incentive that's more powerful than market forces, than market fundamentals, and there's no tax incentive we can give that's going to offset lower oil prices when it comes to businesses making decisions. What we think state government should look at is how to invest in further diversifying the economy, and that means investing in education, that means investing in roads, and every time we give a business tax break, that means we have less dollars to invest in those things. At this point, as bad as it is, I think we ought to put everything on the table. Representative Brett Guyman is a Republican member of the Appropriations Committee. He says with the legislature facing a $1.6 billion budget gap, it will need to make some tough political decisions, including possibly scaling back tax incentives. State government depends on 13 percent of its revenue from oil and gas. Dropping oil prices, Guyman says, don't make things any easier. Our budget was originally forecasted on around $95 a barrel, and of course, as we know, it's around 50 or in the 40s currently. Uh, that's caused a severe problem. It's, it's compounded the problem we already have, and that is that we've continued to spend money that we don't have, and we've done that by using one-time funds to pay for the ongoing expenses. The problem is the following year we face that same challenge again, and what we need to do is only spend what we have coming in in order to, to balance the budget. Joining us to explore the effect of dropping oil prices on the state is our studio audience. It includes Baton Rouge area residents and former refinery employees, university officials, and members of Louisiana's Legislative Youth Advisory Council from Gina, Winfield, and Slidell. We thank everyone for being here and all of you for tuning, tuning in. LSU's Public Policy Research Lab surveyed Louisiana citizens on tonight's topic. Here's a look at some of the responses. For respondents who said they are spending less on gasoline than a year ago, 58% said they are spending it on, on other things. 33% said they are saving the extra money and 9% didn't answer. When given a choice between what they would pay at the pump and its connection to the state's budget, 50% would pay more for gasoline if it would allow the state to cut fewer services. 28% would pay less for gasoline with a preference for the state cutting more services. And 22% were unsure. In light of lower prices at the pump, those surveyed were asked about their support for an increase in the state's tax on gasoline with money dedicated to improving the state's infrastructure. 57% of respondents favor the idea, 36% oppose it, and 7% were unsure. And when asked what effect gasoline prices dropping by over a dollar a gallon since last year has had on Louisiana's economy, a total of 45% said very or somewhat positive, 10% said neither positive nor negative, and a total of 38% said a very or somewhat negative effect. 8% were unsure. So let's start there. In Louisiana, do the winners outnumber the losers from dropping oil prices? And is this just a bump in the road or a major blow to our state's economy? Preston, what do you think? I think it's a major bump in the road. I think that higher education is going to take a huge hit. We've got $1.7 billion in budget cuts. Higher education is going to see about $500 billion according to what we expect to see in the budget on Friday. That's huge. It's not something that 
is going to happen just once, though. It's happening year after year, or at least over a long period of time. Something we can expect that when oil prices drop, we're going to get hurt, and we've been, and we'll probably be devastated as a result. Well, of higher that. education has already been hit with budget cuts over the last few years. Yeah. Funding has been very uh, sparse. Do you look for this to continue in the years ahead? How long do you think this is going to last? Until we come up with a solution that's going to fix the problem because we know it's going to happen. All prices go up, they go down. I think our legislature, our governor, needs to come up with a solution that's long-term, that's sustainable, and it's going to withstand when we have these huge drop in oil prices. What kind of solution might that be? Harold, you were in state government. What do you think? Is, is, is a solution possible for state government? I think so in the long term, but it's going to take some uh, real structural changes, which our uh, Commissioner of Administration promises us on Friday. We'll wait to see what those are, but uh, I hope they're long term. Well, in an election year, do you think that's possible? Uh, that's, that's a good guess. <laughs> uh, long term planning in government is four years, uh, elective office, and that's about it. So I, I don't know. Well, Donald, you. You're with the Southern uh, Business School. Yeah, I think we need a more enlightened approach to the budget, especially when we talk about oil. Uh, this is a permanent asset, and we basically shouldn't be spending it on current uses in terms of its impact on the budget. If we follow what some of the Scandinavian countries have done, especially what Norway has done, they have put their particular oil revenues in a permanent fund and only withdraw certain amounts each year in terms of the current budget. So I think an approach like that, and we really need to prioritize our spending in terms of what is a priority as for a state government in terms of education, health, highways, things of that nature that need to be paid for. Well, I spent 16 years covering the legislature at the, we used to call it the big pointy building, the Capitol. And the first year I went there was 1985. The big thing then was there was an $800 million budget shortfall. It seems like every year there's a shortfall in the hundreds of millions, sometimes over a billion dollars. Do you think the public has become inured to this and that they really don't believe that there is a, uh, a shortfall or a problem with state finances, that somehow or other they'll be, they'll be bailed out? Robbie. Actually, it's Robbie. Although. Robbie, okay. Well, my fishing guide calls me Robbie. So oh, okay. okay yeah. Well, you can take me fishing sometime. <laughs> that's right. No, I, um, I think the, the problem is not going to get any easier that uh, the world conditions are such that I think crude prices are going to be up and down for many years to come. And when you look at the plot of uh, crude prices over the past several decades, it was pretty steady until we had the first uh, war in the Gulf. And uh, so I think whatever plan we come up with, we're going to need a leveling factor that will carry the government, uh, whether that is setting aside money or readjusting the budget. It's hard to say. The um, analysts who've been looking at this situation around the world have, are pretty unified in, in saying that the people who are winning and the people who are losing, that, that among the losers are the big oil producing countries who have unstable economies. Venezuela, Russia, Iran. Does Louisiana fit in that mix? Is, is our fundamental economy so unsound that we um, uh, are doomed to this sort of Yo-yo, Earl, you're not on uh, your head. Yes, I'm Earl Peavy from Gina, and, uh, and uh, some of these other folks have uh, good backgrounds in our state government and in our research and in our educational system. I come from industry uh, and engineering, but so I may have a different perspective on certain aspects. Uh, I view our state as being heavily dependent upon oil pricing and the oil and gas industry and therefore not only the state's income to run our government, but also the income into the private uh, and the personal uh, budgets of its citizens. Uh, so therefore they're very closely, uh, both are significantly impacted by the price of petroleum products, uh, specifically uh, crude oil. I think though individually and as producers, we have to anticipate that the boom days may be over as far as long-term planning, uh, but we must anticipate that somewhere in that $70, $75 range, that may be where euphoria is going to be for the foreseeable future. Well, you raise a good point about individual uh, responsibility and individual approach to this. Um, how is this a, a 
affecting y'all individually. Uh, Brad, uh, you're a different generation than me. This is probably the first time you've seen this kind of thing. Uh, what what kind of what's your take on it? Um, <clears throat> I think that it uh, the oil and gas prices are going to fluctuate within the next couple of decades, and I think that's just a uh, just what comes with the industry. And I think that the Louisiana legislature and the uh, and the um, uh, the national government have to make legislation or work on a policy that accommodates these sorts of fluctuations over the years. So, so you think the fluctuations are going to continue year in and year out? Yes, sir. That's what I, I think. Well, Jacob, you're also a younger generation who hasn't seen this. What is your take? Yes, sir. I agree with uh, Brad <laughs> and that I see it uh, fluctuating, going up and down in the future. And I think that our state should try to uh, not rely so heavily upon this um, oil and gas industry as our main or as a main source of uh, income. And um, as Mr. Donald said about uh, maybe using a different method of acquiring the taxes and storing them as in a fund. Well, if you uh, don't have the oil and gas revenue, you're going to have to look someplace else for for revenue. Yes, sir. Um, we saw in the survey that there's pretty widespread support for a gasoline tax if the money goes to highways, Dorsey. Would you be willing to pay more and how much more per gallon if you if you knew that you were going to get better roads? Well, I'm actually a very a unique person to answer that question as I actually don't uh, drive that much. I actually bicycle a lot. Oh, wow. So um, I don't have a problem paying additional funds for gasoline if it's going to something that's necessary. I do have a problem spending it just to give extra money for no good reason. But I don't have a problem paying more for gas if it's going to uh, assist the residents of the state of Louisiana, no. Does anybody have any faith that the legislature is going to raise taxes this year to close this gap? Mm -hmm. well, I, don't, no. I don't think you have to raise taxes to close that gap. You know there's $7 billion worth of tax credits that Louisiana gives to businesses and industry to help them be successful which is great. We need more business and industry to, to, to uh, be successful and come to Louisiana. But when you've got a $1.7 billion hole, don't you think it would be important to carefully look at those tax credits and find a way to roll some of that back to fill that hole? Seems like that, uh, that we, we would be in a much better shape if we did something like that. Our other issue, just forget about oil and gas and the fluctuation. Our other issue is a majority of the state budget is dedicated, all but higher education. Everybody else has a dedication. So if you dedicate all the funds and you can't cut from any place but one spot, you're in a bad situation. We need to come back to the 19, early 1970s like we, like we did in 1973, do a constitutional convention, and let's undedicate all the funds so that the people who are running state government can deal with the ups and downs of the fluctuations of incomes and and lower prices and higher prices. Okay, well we're going to stop on that note. That's all the time we have for this portion of our show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore oil prices in Louisiana. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight we're discussing dollars per barrel, oil prices in Louisiana. We just heard some great points from our studio, studio audience, and now our panel of experts is going to weigh in. Greg Albrecht has been the chief economist of the Legislative Fiscal Office since 1991. In this role, he is responsible for forecasting the state's major tax revenues and estimating the fiscal impact of tax legislation. State Senator Norby Chabert is a Republican from Homa. His district includes most of the Homa Thibodeau region and all of the coasts of Terrebonne and Lafourche parishes. He has worked as a salesman in the oil and gas services industry. Jan Moeller is director of the Louisiana Budget Project, which monitors and reports on state government spending and how it affects Louisiana's low and moderate income families. He is an award winning journalist, formerly with the New Orleans Times Picayune. And David Dismukes is professor, executive director, and director of policy analysis at LSU Center for Energy Studies. Dr. Dismukes' research interests include public policy issues in energy and natural resources. Before we go to our audience for questions, 
I'd first like to ask each member of the panel briefly, from your perspective, who in Louisiana is hurt the most and who is hurt the least by the drop in oil prices? Greg, let's start with you. Uh, hurt the most, obviously, if you're in the oil and gas business and affiliated business, service businesses, there are job losses occurring. That's the worst kind of hurt there is. Hurt the, uh, benefiting the most, just the average household. Lower energy prices, particularly gasoline prices, uh, is money in people's pocket. That's a good thing for most households. Uh, personally, I think uh, there, there really are no winners in Louisiana, unfortunately, whenever the price drops as, as low as it has, as suddenly as it has. We're so interwoven in this state uh, from an indirect standpoint on a dependency on oil and gas revenue. Uh, even though, as a state, it may only make up 13 percent of our budget, the economy is so dependent. Whether you're working at a public university that's dependent on state dollars or you're a waitress in a restaurant that, that is working maybe two jobs, when the price uh, of oil drops, it hurts the economy and it hurts everybody. I would echo what Greg said. Uh, the losers are the folks who are directly affected, the folks who work in the oil and gas industry. And the winners are most households in Louisiana that are seeing more money in their pockets. I would also add to the list of losers, there are going to be some painful budget cuts coming. We'll learn about them later this week. Uh, we don't know who it's going to affect, how it's going to affect, but, but that's also uh, going to affect people uh, when, I, when oil prices drop. Yeah, and I'd have to agree. I mean, the losers are going to be those that are employed in the service sector here in Louisiana, and the winners are obviously going to be the consumers here in the state in terms of the lower prices they're paying for retail gasoline. Reverend Bertel, yes. you had a question that you wanted to ask the panel. That yeah, I really wanted to ask Dr. Dismukes. Um, one of the things that uh, has uh, helped propel uh, the oil industry in America is the fact that we uh, have the ability to extract natural gas and use it in our boilers and, and other uh, equipment. Uh, we extract it at a lower price because we can use fracking. The EU has stringent uh, laws and, and regulations against fracking. Uh, however, if they were to re, uh, uh, relax those uh, restraints, uh, it would drastically impact uh, what they're able to, to sell oil for. And I'm just wondering what would that uh, do to our state and what would that do to uh, the American economy as a whole? Well, I think it's a good question. There are a considerable amount of unconventional resources, not only in, in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, but in China and other places in the world. And they're looking very carefully at what's going on in North America in terms of learning how to extract these uh, appropriately and productively. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is, right now, North America is the primary place where you can fracture and, and extract these unconventional resources uh, cost effectively. Uh, it's not only the fact that we have a very good geology for that, but also the fact that we have the infrastructures, we have the roads, but most importantly, we have rules and regulations here in the United States and the system of property rights that you don't have in other places of the world. The governments, for instance, own a lot of those mineral rights and those subsurface rights that you have to negotiate with, for instance, in order to go in and fracture wells if you're in Poland or if you're in somewhere else in Eastern Europe. So it, it could very well be the case that other countries are going to start reassessing their positions on this as they move forward in time. Uh, but it's not a dramatic change that's going to come overnight. There are other countries in Europe that are looking at this. I think you're probably a good five to ten years off, even if people were to start today. So it wouldn't dramatically impact us. But I think it's something that would be more beneficial in terms of diversifying energy sources uh, around the globe by having more self-sustaining producers. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you, in addition to that, um, since not just the oil and gas, but um, the petrochemical industry, um, light hydrocarbons and such all use natural gases in their furnaces to crack mm -hmm. LPG. And uh, so I, I think, I guess my question is, if it were to, uh, if those laws were to change, those regulations were to be, uh, be relaxed, uh, wouldn't it affect more than just the gas pump? Wouldn't it affect the chemical industry? that produces other things. It, it could, but I think uh, we're in a position right now in, I think, U.S. manufacturing history where um, the scales are still tilted towards the U.S., and, and particularly Louisiana. There are people who are becoming concerned about uh, these billions of dollars of investments that have been announced, many of which have already gone in the ground, many of which are already underway. Uh, there are probably going to be some cancellations, and we've heard of some already, and that has to do with the unique nature of what they're trying to do in terms of 
for lack of better words, arbitraging <laughs> these hydrocarbons. Uh, but right now, I think we're pretty still well positioned to take advantage of a lot of that. I, I think Darcy had a, a question along those lines about diversifying and making future plans. Um, if it's already known that the oil industry is an up and down industry, then what is the plan for addressing that? Uh, I mean, if it's something that's foreseeable, then why not have a plan to make this whole avoidable? I, I think maybe Senator Schaubert ought to start that one. Yeah, the, the thing that people <laughs> have to realize is that it, in nature, yes, we are an oil and gas economy, but, but we are more an oil and gas service economy than anything. It, it's, it's not like Shell or Chevron have their corporate headquarters uh, you know, in downtown Baton Rouge or, or in downtown New Orleans. Um, the majority of the companies that, that make up uh, the Louisiana oil and gas economy or, or service uh, companies, whether they're servicing um, deep water drilling, whether they're in, in fabrication of the actual platforms or the offshore supply vessels that service uh, these rigs in deep water or in shallow water, um, those are the people that, that are employed. Those are those, are those multipliers uh, that say, okay, well, if, if, if a company opens up in South Homa and employs uh, 50 people, right? Well there's a multiplier that's going to attach to that, meaning you're going to need more people working at the hospital, at the, at, the, at the school, at the Walmart, everywhere. And the same thing happens whenever that particular uh, company may close down. So it, it's difficult to say, well, how do you change your economy to deal with, with something that is so cyclical like, like oil and gas is? Um, let's face it. Half of the reason why we do what we do in Louisiana is, is one reason and one reason only, the geographic proximity to where the oil is. And uh, that's, that's a huge determinant on, on what you do. If you're going to be in Kansas, you're going to plant corn. If you're going to be in South Louisiana, you're going to service the oil and gas uh, industry because that's where the oil and gas is. Greg, um, you and I were both around the legislature in the 90s when they were wrestling with this before all this talk about diversifying the economy. Have we diversified far enough to where we're not going to see as huge an impact in Louisiana as we Well, we're, we're more diversified than we were in the mid-80s when I started down there, obviously. Uh, we're going to be a large oil and gas, broadly defined, you know, extraction to petrochemical refining for probably forever. We are endowed with the resource, and we've got you know, generations of skill sets developed here. That's what we're going to do, but we are more diversified. We don't. It, it, the, the ups and downs of the oil prices used to generate much bigger swings in our economy and in the state's revenue base than they they do now. Not that they're immaterial, but it's not like it was in the mid '80s. We lost half the industry in that in that downturn, uh, and and much of other industries. That's not what's happening today. Not to belittle the losses that are occurring in communities and in and in companies and in households today, but it's. We're not nearly as affected as we were. That's a sign of our diversity. Stoney, you had a question about individuals. What can we do so that the price of oil does not negatively affect the state, but in the state, like, I don't know, like, programs? I, I think the state budget's always going to be affected by oil prices in some ways, but, but like Greg said, you know, in the mid-80s, 40 percent of the state budget was made up of oil and gas revenue. Now it's down to 13 percent, so the swings aren't nearly, uh, we're not nearly as dependent on oil as we once were, and, and I think that's, that speaks to the diversification that's happening. We need to continue to diversify, and we need to continue to focus on the fundamentals. Uh, if, if state government can do a good job educating uh, its people, build strong roads, build safe communities, then I think business will come here. Uh, businesses of all kinds are going to want to come to Louisiana and build and grow. Um, and I think in the last few years, we've maybe gotten away from some of that. Uh, we've been cutting higher education. We've been cutting money that goes to roads and basic infrastructure. And I think if we can keep on focusing and get back to focusing on the fundamentals, we're going to grow our economy, an economy that works for not just the oil and gas industry, but for everybody, including all the folks in Louisiana who don't depend on that industry. Well, there's other states around us that have heavy oil and gas uh, production and exploration and servicing Texas. They don't seem to be hit as hard. Is it are they? Is it because they're bigger? Or are they? Have they done a better job diversifying? I think they are getting hit yeah, as they're hard. Hit pretty doggone hard. They are getting uh, hit as hard. The thing that that separates us and, and Texas, 
uh, from the actual extraction standpoint is that the majority of our extraction occurs off of um, offshore. Texas was really hit by by the from the fracking side with initially with the low price uh, of natural gas and now with with the cost of uh, actually locating leasing you know and, and Dr. Desmuse could probably talk uh, specifically on some of these things the cost of the actual fracking extraction is just the return on investment is not there so Texas is uh, the whole eager for eager for chair was basically in West Texas and it's pretty much shut down now they're feeling it they're feeling bad. Their, their underlying economic impacts are going to be stronger because they have a fracking industry. We, for all practical purposes, do not. Right. Uh, we, we, all of our vertical oiling is selling for less, and it's a state fisc hit and some private sector hit. But we're not, we, we haven't developed a big frac, oil fracking industry, and our gas fracking was in Haynesville, and that shut down, relatively shut down after gas prices fell. <coughs> and there's not, lot, there's not a lot to lose in terms of actual economic impact. That doesn't mean there's no economic impact. It's just we're not nearly as reliant on this particular kind of oil and gas extraction as the as the big fracking states are, Texas, North Dakota primarily. Sheila, you had a question about regulations? Uh, do uh, oil and gas regulatory services in the, uh, for the producers operators in central Louisiana I've been hit economically. My household income decreased as producers started shutting in wells and only operating ones that were the most profitable in our area. Uh, my question, I, I, I obviously know how the individual families impacted, but I wonder uh, from the state's viewpoint, is there a are there studies that the state has done that we, you know, the average citizen could go look at the website and see how the state legislature has taken action to shift our tax base from oil revenue, like royalties, the state royalties, state fees, state severance taxes, and of course income taxes from people that work in the industry. But to shift that 13% to, to other sources of revenue. You want to take the um, <laughs> 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 much of the shift in the state's revenue mix has been a result of an actions taken after the early '80s and mid '80s oil bust, and we're down from 42 percent oil and gas to 13 percent. We in, we brought in gaming revenue, we raised income taxes, we raised sales taxes, uh, we raised corporate taxes. And that's the structure we're still living on today. This oil bust has not been reacted to in that way yet. I don't know that it will be either, but we have a mix we have today as, as a response. It took 10 years or more of changes to get to the mix we've got now. It still leaves us with 13%, and that's typically about 1.3, 1.4 billion. You lose 300, 400 million of that. That's real money. And don't you forget to remind her about the taxes that we did cut as well. Well, and mm -hmm. a, 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 as a result of the big boom, the post-Katrina Rita boom, and the run-up of the, the last uh, economic expansion just before the recession, we cut taxes substantially, mm -hmm. some of those income taxes and sales taxes. And we're now run, we now have a, you know, a revenue baseline that's running below the pre-storm path. Uh, but the, the, the fundamental mix, pie chart mix, today is really a, re a reaction, things we did to the mid-80s. Maybe we'll change that mix going forward, but quite frankly, we haven't had a session yet in, in response to this particular uh, weakness in oil prices. In this, terms of where you can go yeah. to to find some information about the studies you were, were talking about, if there were uh, uh, three places I'd steer you to, it'd be Louisiana Economic Development's website, uh, probably the Workforce Commission website, and uh, look at a couple of different universities, uh, you know, certainly LSU, uh, UL, Louisiana Tech, Nichols, th those are going to be uh, your universities that kind of have studies focused on oil and gas exploration and, uh, and the economies that are around it. And as far as general information about the state budget, Greg's website is, is very good. The Legislative Fiscal Office yeah. keeps a lot of great information about what's in the budget. They put out a lot of stuff on their website if you go there and look. So. 
my, <coughs> my friends uh, Melinda Dislat with the Associated Press and uh, Mark Ballard from The Advocate have pointed out that the current state budget problems are not all oil and gas related. A lot of it, over a billion dollars of it, is related to the way spending patterns have been over the last few years, to the tax cuts and to using a bunch of one-time money to uh, plug into recurring expenses. Harold, you had a question that uh, really, I think you ought to start with Senator <laughs> Chavier. Well, I was going to direct this at Greg when he mentioned uh, cutting income taxes. Maybe it's time to bring back the Steli plan, at least the revenue side of it, and, uh, and level out our taxes so that they are not at the mercy of the volatility of the oil and gas industry. Uh, we had at one time what somebody, a friend of mine, called an embarrassment of riches. Now we're just embarrassed <laughs> that we got this one point whatever billion dollar hole that we need yeah. to fill. Why, why don't, Greg, why don't you start by at least explaining the Stelly plan in 25 uh, words or less? Yeah, I know, I'm not good at the The Stelly plan got rid of sales taxes on, on household food for home consumption, household utilities, actually put those that tax base in the Constitution, never to be hit again unless the people vote to tax that those items. It, it traded that, that revenue loss off with an increase in the personal income tax, which not only increased the overall income tax, it shifted the burden to the upper half of the income spectrum. So Vic Stelly had a variety of goals in mind. At its outset, it was revenue neutral. In fact, I think we actually lost money in the first year or two of that. But it was designed to grow because it would be tied to income, which grows faster than sales taxes. And it did that for several years. But in the in in the uh, as the as the economy heated up in the mid 2000s and then in the post Katrina Rita after Katrina Rita hit in, in in the summer of 2005, we had ultimately had more money coming in than we knew what to do with, and the revenue base just exploded on us, and we couldn't resist. We started giving some of that back, and Stelly the Stelly income tax component was yeah. the part we gave back. Great. We'll follow up on that. What would our budget hole look like today if we <coughs> kept that got just a wild guess about or whatever uh, if you if this the income taxes would be roughly at least 800 million dollars higher today than they than they otherwise are and senator Schaber, in an election year how likely is it that anyone would touch that third rail well you know <laughs> you always hear that what's election year the the legislature is going to be paralyzed i will argue that we are called to service right and you have to respond to a crisis with bold action and if you're worried about getting reelected myself included and you're going to sacrifice what's to be done right for the state of Louisiana well, well then we should throw the bums out myself included um, the, the the problem is is that the structural tax gathering apparatus in this state and the um, the the thing the spending dedications that we have statutorily are are a complex um, problem to solve. Uh, our fiscal session this year is roughly, you know, 60 days. Uh, we've been working on on this problem for a long time because with revenue estimating, we can anticipate what, what a budget shortfall is going to be, Harold, as you know, and and it's not an easy fix. Um, I what I what I foresee happening is we're going to unfortunately have to bear the brunt of this massive uh, budget deficit and after this next election cycle with a new administration. As, you, as we all know, we have a very powerful executive branch uh, in this state. Uh, you'll probably see some bold action have to be taken uh, by the next legislature and certainly the next governor. Well, Jan, do you think that the, that the average citizen is ready for taxes? Uh, they're going to have to be <laughs> whether they're ready or not. I mean, the elephant in the room here is that we have a, a governor who has refused to look at the revenue side of the ledger for the past seven years, uh, and that's and and that every time we've been faced with a budget shortfall, and we've had budget shortfalls uh, seven years in a row now, I believe, we've only looked to cut. And when we were finished cutting, and when there was nothing more to cut, we've used one-time revenues to patch the remainder of the gap. We have raided trust funds, we have sold state property, we have used money for legal settlements. <coughs> we found every trick in the book. Uh, that plus budget cuts has been the only solution, and we haven't looked at all at the revenue side. Now, nobody likes to raise taxes. I don't think any politician runs for office trying to raise taxes, 
but that's a conversation that's coming. It may not come this session because this governor has set the rules of the road and the legislature has abided by those rules. But next year, next governor, whoever it is, is going to raise taxes. The only question is by how much and from whom it's going to be raised. But that conversation is coming because we just can't keep kicking the can down the road with this budget like we have been for the last several years. And if you think about taxes, just uttering the words raising taxes, <laughs> it, you know, it, it gets a response <laughs> out of people where they automatically cringe. But if you just think about spreading it out, okay, um, we have one, almost the seventh lowest gasoline tax, the seventh, sixth or seventh lowest diesel tax. We have the lowest cigarette tax in in um, the South, maybe one of the lowest, in, lowest in, the in the country. country. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's not about pointing at one particular sector, business entity, and saying we are going to raise your taxes by thirty percent. You can't do that. A, it, it's politically yeah. impossible to do. Uh, the outcry, regardless of the type of revenue that it would generate, uh, would, would be frowned upon by, by many public interest groups and whatnot. Yeah. But I think that because the Louisiana tax burden on even just the ordinary citizen is so low, that we could come up with a restructuring of things uh, that would have to include eliminating a lot of tax credits uh, on things. Reverend. Uh, from what I understand, about 38 cents uh, of every uh, gallon of gas we buy in Louisiana, about 38 cents of that uh, is taxes, state and federal. State and federal. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the state aspect is somewhere around 20. Six, yeah. About 20 cents. Do you see in the foreseeable, foreseeable future uh, that increasing substantially uh, because of the shortfall in, in, uh, in the budget? Well, if you look from an infrastructure standpoint, and, and, and correct me uh, where I need to be corrected, Greg, you know, we've got like a $12 billion transportation infrastructure backlog, $12 billion. Yeah. Um, when we passed, when you, most of you, not some of you younger folks in the audience, <laughs> but when we <laughs> voted in those gas taxes, um, the, the four cents time program, I mean, that was saying we're going to raise X amount of revenue and it's going to pay for, you know, YZ, yeah, the A, B, double A, double B, C, all of these projects over a, a long period of time. Uh, some of those projects have come to fruition. Some are still in the books. The problem is, is that when you initially pass those taxes, okay, uh, the, the, the 16 cents gas tax when it was passed and the additional four for the time program, you know, that was in 1990. Yeah, 1990 cents. Okay, a cent in 2015 is not the same cent. The price of doing business has increased so greatly that you really have a 20 cents gas tax that is generating you what would have been in those days, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten cents. Jamie. Um, are we, do you feel that we are just experiencing a small hiccup in the oil and gas industry, or is this a major halting point for Louisiana and for, I guess, Texas and the other states as well? Don't you start well, I don't. I don't know if it's a halting point, but I think we. This is a, a very significant structural change in the industry, not only here in the United States but globally. Uh, if you look at where commodity traders are looking at trading for crude oil months and years out into the future, they're trading at prices that see crude oil at low prices for many, many years, going out into 2015. I mean, for very. I mean, not 2015, but 2020 and past that time period. So the conventional wisdom and the expectation now is that prices will stay relatively low. And we're probably not going to get back to a hundred dollar barrel of oil, at least in the, in the foreseeable future. Uh, as most of you recognize, things can change tomorrow. They can be a war in the Middle East. Uh, we can get cutbacks in uh, production in Venezuela. There can be a strike somewhere. And those all change the dynamics on a day in and day out basis. But one of the big consequences of all this unconventional development has been diversifying the supplies of crude oil, increasing those supplies that are outside of the traditional OPEC producing countries and that is putting downward pressure on prices and it's going to be there for some time to come. And even if those prices start to rise again, it's going to create opportunities for operators here in North America to go back into those reserves. That genie is out of the bottle. It, we may put it to the side for a little bit, but as soon as prices start to rise again, and they don't have to rise considerably, people will go back into that business. You know, Greg was talking earlier about the contraction in natural gas in unconventional plays like Haynesville here uh, in the aftermath of the last recession where we saw prices, you know, fall by over half then. 
uh, what you what you wound up seeing is while a lot of that drilling activity decreased during that time period, you found producers getting more and more efficient, reducing cost, uh, increasing well productivity, increasing efficiencies. You're going to start seeing it on the crude side of the business as well. So you're going to continue to see, I think, supplies grow, not as quickly as we had originally anticipated, but they're going to continue to grow. There's going to continue to be opportunities in this business, and um, I, I think it's going to be a change that's going to be with us for quite some time. I was just wondering the uh, so that the price for crude is around 60 bucks. When it reaches that level, uh, the Bakken crude production is at a break-even point. At least that is what's stated. Now, they may be able to make improvements, too, but you'd hate to see that great stream back off. Our energy independence might uh, be slowed a bit. That's true, and, uh, you know, there was the same conversations that were going on in, uh, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010 when people are saying the natural gas business couldn't survive at you know anything less than four dollars and fifty cents right well hub prices are two fifty three dollars today and natural gas production continues to increase so I think we're going to continue to have these discussions and find out what that low break even price is one of the things that we found in this business is that because it's very competitive uh, people are, are scrambling around to find ways to be more productive uh, they're finding ways to improve the technology of this fracking uh, it's one of those rare areas in the energy business where unit costs are going down, they're not going up because of the increased efficiencies. And there's a lot of learning by doing. It's a more repetitive task. It is not like uh, traditional oil, vertical oil and gas drilling. It is more repetitive. It's more like mining. Once you get in there, you, you know, your goals, and once you get into a particular place like the Bakken or the Eagle Ford, and you start infill drilling, you start filling in in those areas, you start to gain substantial economies and uh, substantial efficiencies because you've got the infrastructure in place, you've got the workforce in place, you've got all those, those opportunities. So people are going to be questioning what those break-even prices are, and you're going to find they're probably a little lower than what, what people are saying right now. Well, Carl, if we, if we have $7 billion worth of tax credits that are sitting on the table that we're not collecting now, and we have a $1.6 billion hole, now, wouldn't it make sense that we roll some of those back, collect some of those taxes that are supposed to have been ta uh, used anyway, and fill that hole? Doesn't that make sense? Senator? You got yes. $7 billion worth of taxes on the table right now that are not being collected to incentivize business, which makes sense. I understand mm -hmm. that. Every other state does it. But when you've got a $1.6 billion hole, and you look at cutting and gutting higher education because that's the only place you can cut. We got to find another way to solve that problem. And it seems like to me we need to roll back some of those tax incentives and giveaways. Well, that's, you know. <laughs> Can't do it all, but you can do some. Correct. Um, there's a uh, prevailing attitude that a, uh, a rollback of a tax credit equates to an indirect tax increase on whomever is the recipient of that tax credit. Um, there's a lot of credence to that. You know, a company may come in from some place and say, you know, this incentive was, was the only reason why I came here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there would be uh, a substantial amount of, of studying and research by LED as well as our own uh, legislative fiscal office to go in and say, okay, this is, this is really just line yop. This is not, it, it, of course it's going to affect this company's bottom line, but it ain't going to break down that business. Um, we had an incident uh, a couple of sessions ago, or was it last session, Greg, where we decided that the state solar tax credit was just too much, and we, we in effect, mm -hmm. you know, guillotined it. And uh, that was, when we walked into committee and made that vote, we were going to get, get, I mean, cut the head off of the solar tax credit industry in the state, because when you coupled it with the federal tax credit, it was basically, you know, we were subsidizing Wait, paying 75% of the installation of, the, of these things too much. Okay. The problem was was that here are all these Louisiana companies, and we're not talking about foreign investors or, or, or even you know people from the foreign state of Texas that were coming in here. These were Louisiana companies that had Louisiana inventory, you know, in Louisiana parishes paying Louisiana taxes. So it didn't make any sense for us to, in fact, guillotine them. What we did was we said, okay, we're going to eliminate this crack tax credit, but it's going to be a gradual uh, elimination of it. You would have to do that, and when you did that, there are going to be very few incidences where, as Greg knows, you're going to get the money right back on the table for rolling back. But I do agree with you; we do well, have to restructure. Well, well some Greg, of those. what about it? Can you could you find some tax credits that would that you could do that to very quickly and generate some revenue? There, 
things we have done in the past where certain types of credits or deductions we have said for the you know for the tax period starting January 1 2015 I mean that would be the effective language this this tax year we're in right now from that tax year it's not effective and when you file your taxes in the spring of 2016 liabilities will go up we have done that before that's not something we've typically done and it's not really applicable to a lot of programs that have uh, certifications, applications, contractual arrangements, That's what I was going to ask. Is how, many, how many of those tax credits really are contractual obligations that you can't do anything about at this point? Hundreds of, well, I'm going to say four to five hundred million easy. That would be the easy list that no one would argue about. And then there will be a variety of other people will say, well, I may not have a contract, but I started, I carried out certain activities <clears throat> you owe me. And there would be a moral obligation at a minimum. However, we have reversed some of those things in the past, but uh, we, were, we were doing that for excess itemized deductions on personal income tax for three years before Stelly ever came along. And you just said, hey, halfway through the, through the tax year, we just decided you weren't going to get that break when you filed in the following spring. You can do that. Uh, you don't have billions of dollars like that, but I mean, things like that can be done, but those are tough votes. I mean, they're not easy to do. Reverend Reed, we haven't heard from you. Yes. Um, with the low prices in the oil and gas, uh, the ripple effect is very, very important and significant right now because I have a concern or the community has a concern for cuts in health care and human services. And to just name an example, the recent uh, announcement of closing the emergency room at our Baton Rouge General Local Hospital. And so the ripple effect continues to uh, make cuts, and so we're just concerned about the cuts that will occur in our next legislative uh, session, and hopefully I need to find out how will that affect additional cuts or will there be any? Well, Reverend Reed, that's why I said you know, very early on that I don't think that there are really any winners when yes. the price of oil drops as low as it did as fast as it did. Because, you know, I'll go back to that single mother that may be working one or two jobs, and she lives on the other side of town, but her job is, is on, on the more affluent side. Yes. Well, yeah, it's going to be cheaper for her to drive from that apartment to that job. But the problem is, maybe when she was working that Friday night, late night shift, that four top that was spending, you know, a couple of hundred dollars at that, at that restaurant, they're not, they not showing up every Friday like they used to. And what does that do? That affects her tips. Well, if she's not getting her tips, she can't pay her rent. And that makes her more, and then, you know, that puts her more dependent upon the services of the state, whether it's in health care or whether it's in any other social service. Well, we go back to the direct impact of the actual uh, lessening of revenue coming in, and we have cuts at places like the general. You know, so it, it's tough to really find a winner in, in, in South Louisiana, particularly when, when it drops as low as it has because of the yeah, indirect yeah. impact. Yeah. Preston. With a crisis like we have in terms mm -hmm. of the financial crisis, it would seem that there certainly is an opportunity to take advantage of reinvesting in other areas. Right now, with $500 million expected in budget cuts to higher education, isn't this really the time while we're talking about all prices to say, look, we're going to invest in our future in higher education and, and those areas that are important for growing the economy in decades and years to come down the road. Is the legislature in a position now to say, look, we think this is so important for the future that we're going to reinvest. Instead of cutting higher education, we're going to reinvest in it. We're going to protect it. Maybe some constitutional mandate so that we're not dumbing down the state of Louisiana by cutting education every time there's a blip because of dropping in oil prices. We live in Louisiana where we expect hurricanes. We prepare for them. We should protect, uh, expect that we're going to have drops in oil prices and there should be measures in place to plan and reinvest in important places like higher education for years to come. I, I, I couldn't agree more. We absolutely, now is the time to reinvest. Now is the time to do that. But you have to have the money 
to reinvest, and that requires, again, a very difficult conversation about taxes. <coughs> Who should pay? How much money do we need to take in as a state? And where do we want to spend that money? And, and right now, Louisiana, frankly, is a <coughs> low-tax state. We have the fourth lowest tax burden in the country uh, as a percentage of GDP. So if, if low taxes was the answer to economic prosperity, we would be one of the richest states in the country. But instead, we're having these budget problems year after year. So I think, it's a, again, it's a difficult question, but it's a question that, that has to be asked, and it's a debate that has to happen because, again, the, the states with the, if you look around the country, the states that have the highest median incomes are the states that have the highest percentage of their population with bachelor's degrees. There's no clearer path to prosperity as a state than having an educated population. That requires sustained long-term investments, the kind of investments we've been losing the last few years, and the kind of investments we need to start thinking about making again. It's not something that's going to have an immediate return. It doesn't maybe lead to a groundbreaking or, or some kind of ribbon-cutting ceremony, but it's the kind of investments that if you do it over a sustained period of time, you can have that diversified economy that I think everybody wants. And you've had the government. last word. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've run out of time for our question and answer segment. We'd like to thank our panelists, Mr. Albrecht, Senator Chabert, Mr. Moeller, Dr. Desmukes, for their insights in this month's topic. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. Well, you know, Carl, um, I, I suppose there are no easy answers to this large uh, budget deficit. Maybe not to the budget deficit, but we can all go out and get some more gas while it's cheap. We can, well, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, and I guess one of the things I look back on is that when we set up a fund, the AG Offshore Oil Revenue, we did put it into higher yeah. education and K-12 education. And whatever happened to that old rainy day trust fund? There is a rainy day trust fund. Maybe we'll be looking at it. I never don't know. know. Well, never that's know. all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, take this month's survey, view additional sound bites, and comment on tonight's show. We would love to hear from you. Like we did following last month's program, Louisiana After Ferguson. Nikki writes to us, police have a license to kill. It's not a racial issue. It is a blue, non-blue issue. Bill wrote to us, no matter the color, disobey the police and expect consequences. Take personal responsibility for you and your family's conduct. Joseph wrote to us, I believe that we are so desperate for security that we sacrifice first our legal protections from militarized police, and then we sacrifice our dignity as human beings. Well, that was a complex topic, and we thank everyone for your comments. Tonight's a tough one. Well, next time's going to be even tougher. Next time we're going to talk about cancer. And that's a very personal topic for a lot of us. So why does Louisiana have the second highest cancer death rate in America? What role do lifestyle and genetics play in the equation? Join us next month as Louisiana Public Square brings together residents living with cancer and experts on the front lines of research to explore cancer in Louisiana. Thanks for watching and good night. Good night, everyone. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you.